Good evening and welcome to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. Well, from mimosas at brunch to post-work beers to popping the champagne bottle on New Year's Eve, drinking alcohol has always been portrayed as the ultimate way of having a great time. Our culture revolves around alcohol in many ways, from networking opportunities to celebrating weddings, happy hours, and all the events you could possibly imagine in between. Conversely, not drinking can somehow seem suspect. If you abstain, you might be accused of being a raging alcoholic or a virtue signaling prude who doesn't know how to have fun. Yet recently, a shift has begun. It's called the sober curious movement. Those who drink less or not at all are doing so mindfully and broadcasting their abstinence with pride. More and more, sobriety is being seen as a spectrum, and the rationale behind it is that everyone could benefit from taking a step back and reassessing their relationship with alcohol. Tonight's guests will talk about some of the reasons why you might want to drink less or not at all, and how to do so and not feel like you're missing out on life's special moments. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's panel of guests. First, we have Dr. Catherine Paradis, one of Canada's leading experts on alcohol. She joined the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction in 2014 to help develop and implement alcohol-related policies at the federal government level. For the past several years, she has led the implementation of the Post-Secondary Education Partnership, which has over 40 post-secondary institutions as members. Catherine is a sociologist who has also helped produce Canada's low-risk alcohol drinking guidelines. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you, Barbara. Next, I am so pleased to welcome Jen McNeely. She is the founder of Toronto publication SheDoesTheCity.com. She's also a freelance writer and volunteers her time as a facilitator for the Toronto She Recovers Weekly Meetup. Jen is in recovery from alcohol use disorder and will be celebrating a decade of sobriety this year. Thank you so much for joining us, Jen. Thank you. Later on in the show, we will be joined by beverage curator and dry mixologist Kyle Ratchford. He whips up amazing non-alcoholic cocktails at local Ottawa coffee house Arlington 5, four nights a week and will be showing us how to do so on the show so make sure you stick around for that and as always our guests are delighted and excited to hear from you if you have any questions that you'd like to ask from our guests please call the number on your screen 613-728-1001 Catherine I'd like to start with you what does the landscape look like for Canadians and their relationship with alcohol? What does some of the latest research tell us? So the vast majority of Canadians drink. It's roughly every year about 80% of can Canadians who report having a drink in the past year. Um, and most people have a pretty healthy relationship to alcohol. But we can't deny the fact that there's also f roughly 20%, up to 30% among the younger groups who drink in excess who drink too much and who therefore increase their risk of suffering from um, an injury, getting into an accident, or later on developing uh, any type of chronic disease. Now how do you define healthy relationship with alcohol? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who don't think that they have a problem. How do you know wh whether you fall in the 20% or the 80%? So it was in 2012 that a group of scientists in Canada um, uh, gathered and developed what we call today Canada's low risk drinking guidelines. And according to those guidelines, if you want to minimize your risk of developing a chronic disease later in life, for women you should never take more than two drinks per day, for men it should never be more than three. And when it comes to your risk of injuries and accidents and causing harm, uh, women should never uh, take more than three and men should never take more than four. Before operating a vehicle or? Well that might be even lower than that. Of course we recommend that there are some situation where in fact not drinking at all might even be a better. Mm -hmm. Operating a vehicle is definitely one of those. Uh, women who are pregnant or trying to get pregnant or if you're caring for a small child or, or, or just someone uh, that and that you need to be very alert of course then you should uh, not be drinking. Now, Jen, you're celebrating almost 10 years of mm -hmm. sobriety. I'd love to hear more about what that journey has looked like for you. Um, I read the recent Toronto Star article that you wrote about your journey and about also being married to a wine sommelier. Oh, yeah. So that can be easy. I, I'd like to hear more about, you know, how did you get here? What, what has the last decade looked like for you? 
Well, I would say that right now looks very different than life 10 years ago. Um, recovery is a very slow process. The rewards can come quickly, but it is a lifetime journey. So when I began um, my journey in recovery, um, it was about getting through every day. And sometimes it was about getting through every hour. And um, for me, what that looked like was, you know, just um, taking really small steps throughout the day. And sometimes that would be like, what do I, a slogan that I would refer to often, which in AA is a common thing we, we talk about the slogans, um, was do the next right thing. So in early recovery, life has changed so dramatically and it's not just necessarily about uh, when when you were drinking but just about everything you're feeling things differently you are seeing things differently there's a a, a newfound clarity um, there's also a lot of confusing feelings so uh, getting through each day is really about breaking it down and um, you know I'm gonna do the dishes then I'm going to have some food then I'm gonna call a friend then I'm gonna go to a meeting then I'm going to you know look into some therapy um, it can be a slog and then as you start to kind of get more comfortable with um, you know n not drinking and new habits and really feeling your body differently for the first time um, then you just it's like anything else. It's like going to the gym. When you start exercising, you're working on some muscles and it takes time to build that up. So now I would say my recovery looks quite different than it did then. Um, I, still, I, I still have to be very vigilant about my recovery, um, but I do different things now. I think of recovery as sort of a pie chart where um, at different points in your life, there's different categories that um, you know create a your health, your best self, I guess, your healthiest version of yourself. And so for me, that is connection. Um, it's a weekly um, circle with other women in recovery. It's, Camaraderie, feeling yeah, like you're part of a community. It's and nature, it's exercise, it's creativity, it's writing, it's all these different things. And I love that now recovery, um, we're getting to a point where we're realizing that it does look different for everybody um, and that it's about um, you know you're just it's there's a holistic approach and it's not um, it it fits into every part of your life really so what was your relationship with alcohol like you know for, from an early age and how did it get to the point where you realized you had a problem uh, I would say that I knew I always had a problem so I started drinking when I was 14 and um, the first evening, I can remember so clearly when I um, drank some wine, I had a feeling that came over me, a numbness, an escape, uh, escapism that was such relief to me. I was a stressed out young person and I loved it and I had never felt anything like it and I knew I was going to chase that feeling. Like I knew as soon as that night was over. I'm looking forward to the next weekend and this is going to be, you know, grade 10 is all about plotting when I'm going to get that next drink. And then um, in university it accelerated because the drinking culture and the accessibility to it was, you know, all around and I was going to school in Montreal. And I've often felt that the peer pressure to drink is way stronger as an adult than it is as a teenager. Yeah, it was. I think in, in university for sure. It's just what people did every night, you know, and especially certainly what I did every night. So, um, and uh, so then it moved from being a weekend exercise to multiple times a week. And then there's periods in my twenties when I was working in Toronto where it kind of, you know, was a little bit less, and then it would ramp up again. And then by the end of it, I was. You know, I wasn't um, day drink. I never was a day drinker. I didn't sneaky drink. I didn't have like alcohol in my purse. Um, so a lot of people would have said, you're not an alcoholic mm -hmm. because I didn't necessarily fit what they imagined um, an alcoholic look like. But I knew I had a problem and I was falling down drunk on those weekends that I was binge drinking and it was causing negative impacts in my life, my health, my my relationships, my productivity, you know, everything. So um, it really just reached a point where um, 
like well, well I was in a marriage and it was ruining our, our marriage mm -hmm. so it was, it was impacting that a lot um, and that's when I decided okay I have to I have to take this seriously and make a change but I knew I always had a problem I just wasn't ready to deal with it Catherine do you see this as a common problem where people are just not understanding what it means you know to, to have an issue with alcohol that the literacy around alcohol use and abuse is just not there absolutely I think that there are uh, a lot of people who think that they are drinking in a healthy manner and that uh, do not have a problem but unfortunately in Canada a lot of people are unaware of the effects of drinking um, on their health in particular. Uh, as right. you mentioned, alcohol literacy is rather low. We do know now from, from the science that drinking is associated to about 200 chronic disease. Alcohol causes seven types of cancer. We know that now for a fact. It's not just associated, but drinking, drinking too much can cause seven type of cancer. Excessive In consumption of alcohol can lead to. Yes, excessive, but also when it comes to breast cancer, it's actually even at one drink a day you increase your risk of developing breast cancer I by mean, how much uh, by 13% it's, oh. it's a rational risk you know it's not 13% more chances of drink of developing cancer each time you take an additional uh, drink but it's it's uh, it's when you take an additional drink, the initial risk you had is increased by 13 percent. It's, it's a little bit difficult to, to understand uh, uh, when you first uh, see those data, but I think that the important message here is that alcohol do causes cancer, something that is known by only 20 percent of the Canadian population. And for women in general, what we need to know is that um, our risk of breast cancer increases when we drink. We only have a minute left before we go to break, but do you think overall the sober curious trend is a positive movement? Yeah, I think it is, and it's interesting because it used to be that people who didn't drink were what I would call medical abstainers, people who because of a medical condition or the, or the medicine they had to take could not drink, but now we're seeing more and more of people who I would call experienced abstainers, people who you know realize after a while that maybe drinking was not so much fun fun for them anymore. They didn't enjoy waking up, you know, hangover or with a headache. They are part of that wellness movement and I think it's great that they're exploring this and allowing themselves to see how they can live their life without alcohol. That's great. I want to hear more from you, Catherine, and from your experience, Jen, when we, get, when we come back right after the break. Welcome back to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. We're talking about the Sober Curious movement tonight and the growing interest in abstaining from alcohol for a variety of reasons, including health and lifestyle. We have a caller on the line. Heather, are you with us? Yes. Thank you so much for calling in. Did you have a question for our guests? Yes, I do. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for giving this topic a chance because there's not enough conversation happening about the use of alcohol and the abuse of it. Um, I've already learned a little bit about it causing uh, potential for cancer. I didn't even know that. But my question is uh, that if you have a family in, that has alcoholism in it, and traditionally when you get together, that is what they do. They drink. And in the past, you were a drinker, but now abstain from it. What kind of things can you suggest to kind of like not seem approved in the midst of a drinking situation. Jen, you're married to a sommelier. Yeah. Well, I would say um, definitely make sure that you have a stock of special beverages for yourself that you can add to the table that make you feel like you're part of things when people are cheersing. Um, there's definitely lots of amazing options out there now, and I, the guest who's coming on will can show you some stuff too, but there's lots of stuff just available at your grocery store that can have a nice bottle that can be put on the table. Um, in terms of sort of if, you, if things are kind of rowdy and, and there's a, a revelry, you know, there's the different a boisterousness about the, the dinner party, um, if that's at all difficult, uh, finding time to just sort of take space and um, go off to an area in the room if you need to take, to take a pause is uh, another thing that can be helpful. 
I think um, like anything, if it's a new transition for you or somebody in your family, um, it can feel really difficult at first, but you know, a couple more times in, it's just going to become a new normal. And so um, I would just encourage you to just keep at it and they'll probably, you know, they might be curious and ask you about you know, the, the lifestyle change and there's ways that you can talk about that. I, I always um, encourage people to come up with a line ahead of time. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, I'm just taking a break because um, I've got a lot going on in life right now and I can't deal with a hangover. Um, or uh, if, if something like that is even uncomfortable, I mean, there's no harm in also just saying like, I'm, I'm on some medication right now and it's... it's um, Antibiotics. Yeah, I don't think there's a problem with having a white lie. Um, but um, certainly as you continue to be that person at the dinner table without the alcohol in front of you, it will become more and more comfortable and, uh, and they'll probably be curious as well and maybe maybe try whatever you're drinking. <laughs> Anything to add to that, Catherine? No, I think that these were a lot of good tips and maybe that you want also to, to maybe have an ally with you prior to that event. You know, you might feel more comfortable with one person in particular and speak with that person and say, you know, I hope that if someone tonight uh, asks questions about my drinking that you can back me up, you mm. know, and, 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 and ask the group to support me in my decision. That might be also a, a way to go about Sounds it. Sounds like a great strategy. Thank you so much for calling in, Heather. Now, a lot of people who are sampling the Sober Curious movement might indulge in what's referred to as dry January or mock October as a way to kind of abstain from alcohol for a month. What do you think about movements like that, those kinds of social experiments, Catherine? So it's really a growing movement that started in the UK, uh, became popular in Australia, and now is really gaining popularity um, in Canada. Um, it's a great way to reassess your, your, your drinking, to, to revise your relationship uh, to alcohol, and there have been, we have limited data um, on the health impact of, of such experiment, but the data we have are promising. Um, we see that people who stop drinking just for 30 days have a better um, blood alcohol pressure, better sugar level. Um, they they uh, they also have a, a better insulin resistance, and they lose weight. So a lot of great things. And a colleague uh, uh, of mine at the University of Sussex in the UK uh, surveyed 800 people who had taken part in the uh, in the experiment. And at the end of 30 months, uh, it was 90 percent who, uh, well, had saved money, which was a good thing. Uh, many reported uh, it was up to 70% who said that they were sleeping much better and 60% who lost weight. So there are lots of good uh, uh, indicators uh, that, 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 that go in favor of, of that experiment. However, there's a little thing that bothers me a little bit mm -hmm. with the whole dry January movement um, as we have um, right now, and it is that um, it, it, it kind of leads us to believe that individuals are the sole responsible of their drinking patterns. And you don't believe in that? Well, if there's one topic on which science is, is, is very clear is that among the most significant determinant of per capita consumption in our society, uh, we find the way that alcohol is sold to us. Marketing. At, at which price, the price, the way it is promoted to us, marketed and advertised. And so while a, a, a significant proportion of Canadians are perhaps thinking of doing a dry month or a dry week and reassessing uh, their relationship to alcohol, I'd like to see our government do the same and rethink their views on, on, on alcohol and alcohol policies and how they could better support Canadians in their choices. Should there be warning labels on bottles of alcohol the way there are on boxes of cigarettes? Well, I mean, alcohol is the only product in Canada for which right now we have no uh, nutrition labeled on the bottles. If you take a bottle of water, you'll see there's zero calorie for wine or for beer, for spirits, you have no idea. And 
Okay. Alcohol is the only legal psychoactive substance right now for which we have no warning labels. So yes, label would be a, a, a right way to start um, just to increase uh, alcohol literacy in the population and make sure that people, when they drink, uh, it's an informed choice. You know, what's interesting is I recently learned about this category of wines called vegan wines. And so my reaction was, well, of course wine is vegan. And then as I continue to read and research, I learned that all kinds of animal products are used to filter wine wines that they don't even have to put on the label and we never know and that just seems like absolute craziness to me um, but I want to hear a little bit more about your perspective on this issue Jen but first we have a caller Sam are you with us yes hi hi thank you so much for calling in did you have a question yes I did um, my question is how do I respond to someone who asks me why I'm not drinking when I'm at a social gathering it's such an annoying question oh yeah. my god you're not drinking how do you respond Jen I respond by saying, you know what, I used to um, I used to drink, but it didn't serve me anymore. It didn't serve me anymore, and so I, I stopped drinking. And I mean, I think that is enough, you know? And if somebody is really curious, it's probably because they have their own concerns and issues that they're exploring. Um, Another way, as we said before, is just to make up a story. But I think I think as long as you say, you know, I'm just trying to be, I'm trying to live a healthier lifestyle right now, and um, so I'm, I'm going to take, I'm taking a break. Have you ever been bullied or intimidated for your decision not to drink? I myself have experienced that. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. Um, you know what? I have been sort of nagged about it. I don't know, if bullied, but I have. Um, definitely received sort of at a party like what do you mean you're not drinking like what's wrong with you like that kind of thing um, but um, I don't know you just get you build a, a thicker skin and it's amazing when you can actually have that conversation where you're like I've actually as you know I turn to some people and I say oh, because I have a drinking problem like I, I'm an alcoholic so I stopped drinking several years ago and it's amazing how that can just uh, you know, stop the stop conversation. Stop their tracks yeah. and um, make them put the discomfort back on them. And so that's one way you can handle it. And I mean, I don't think there's any shame in saying that, but I know that that's not as easy for everybody. Do you feel that the sober curious movement with its Instagram hashtags and its sort of trend, this wellness trend that's being seen as something almost akin to the paleo diet, do you feel like it's maybe glosses over some of the underlying issues for why people may develop an unhealthy relationship with alcohol? Do you feel like it's maybe a little bit reductive in a sense? Uh, I don't think so. It may, it, it may gloss over some of the issues, but I think it's doing more good than not. And I think it's creating more access points for people to seek, you know, to, to make a change in their life or to get help. Um, I know uh, people who have never been able to feel comfortable getting the help they need needed because they felt in order to get help you had to be an alcoholic or in order to stop drinking that is the only way that you would, you know, in society yeah. um, be able to do that. And I mean, I've known women who've died because they didn't get the help they needed because they felt uncomfortable fitting into that category. Um, so I think these movements are acknowledging that, um, you know, there's a very broad spectrum of what um, sobriety means, what sobriety yeah. means and what um, problem drinking means. So if you if if your household is being affected by your drinking, um, if if drinking is having uh, negative effects on your life, you know, you know that that's a problem, even if it's not easily identified in some sort of checklist, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the Sober Curious movement does help um, in the way that the there's earlier entry points. We don't have to wait till we hit a rock bottom to make a change. Now, we only have two minutes uh, before the end of our time together with you. Catherine, was there uh, any last words of wisdom or points that you wanted to make well, before we say goodbye? I think that we received an excellent question. And, and what I'd like to add to that question is that uh, 
I would like us as a society uh, to stop asking that question. Why is it that those who choose not to drink have to come up with an explanation yeah. as to why? Why don't we decide that in, instead, together, we're just going to stop asking that question? At a cocktail, I don't ask you why you didn't dip the carrot in the dip or why you didn't take the cheese. Why would I ask you about the, the type of drink that you, you, you choose? So let's just stop that, and it's going to be, <laughs> make yeah. life easier for a lot of people. There's it's, a lot of reasons why people don't drink. Yeah. and. Um, and I think that uh, you know, when when we have callers asking about that, it it shows how prevalent alcohol is in our society that it's almost unthinkable that we can go to an event, a social event, and not drink. Now, is the fear of social suicide by not drinking is that unfounded? What do you think, Catherine? Um, I, <laughs> It exists, but I think we can definitely change it. I, I work a lot on campuses with students. I see that there's a movement, there's a change, um, uh, and there, this whole wellness movement behind it is is also uh, supporting more people being sober curious. Just a few seconds left before we go to break. What are some resources or what website can uh, our viewers go to for more information? Yeah, well, Jen was speaking about you know some tools to to reassess your drinking um, on the Canadian Center on Substance Use. And addiction website we do have a, a, a just guide have to go to break but uh, our viewers will see that on on the screen thank you so much for joining us tonight thank you. really appreciate your expertise when we come back we'll be talking with Julie who's our caller on the line and welcoming Carla Ratchford a dry mixologist at Arlington 5 don't go away we'll be right back after the break Hi, welcome back to Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour, and on tonight's show, we're talking about the growing sober curious movement. There's no question that low alcohol and non-alcoholic beverages are fast gaining traction. Retail sales have grown to $87.2 billion in the last year alone in North America. Heineken, Peroni, and Guinness have come out with 0% beers in the last few months, and there's all sorts of hip alcohol-free uh, spirits, shrubs, and botanicals like Seedlip, for example, that make your mocktail a lot more interesting than the Shirley Temples and ginger ales of just a few years ago. We're seeing non-alcoholic bars open up across the country and mocktail lists at various restaurants and bars becoming much more interesting. Uh, one of those places is Arlington 5, a local Ottawa coffee shop where you can order mocktails four nights a week. Kyle Ratchford is joining us in the studio now to share his dry mixology secrets. Kyle is a coffee professional with more than a decade of experience in food and beverage. He specializes in using coffee and tea in the place of spirits and that has led him to dive deep into the world of dry libation. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Now before we get into your industry we have a caller on the line. Julie are you still with us? I am. Welcome back. I had to tell you. Uh. I Thank you nice. so much. Thank you for watching the show. Did you have a question for our guests? I do. Um, so I was thinking, like, I don't drink, but I know a lot of my friends that do. And when we go out, like, how would somebody say, like, uh, no, I don't want anything to drink? Because you don't want to look, like, not cool, right? <laughs> how are you cool and still say no? <laughs> Kyle? Um... I mean that's a hard one. I think I think everybody has a little bit of a different sort of internal feeling with that. But I mean, <clears throat> for me personally, in those situations in life where sort of I've been the one who didn't want a drink, I'm sort of unforgiving in my stance in that. It just so you're, you're unapologetic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean that's not for everybody. That's not, but. For me, that's just, it ends a conversation real quick. Now, do you think it's easier for men than for women, Jen? I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. Um, I think it's tricky for everybody at first, but I feel like once you start to do it, then it becomes much easier. And with, with stuff on menus now, most restaurants, um, or, you know, most restaurants should have a, a nice offering of non-alcoholic options. Um, and you can always sort of, you know, if you're feeling sort of boring with your choice, you can always just turn to the 
whoever's doing the cocktails there and be like, you don't have anything interesting here, but can you make me something interesting? You know, and then start a conversation with that person and they'll usually be like, do you like sweet? Do you like more tart? Yeah. And um, that might be a way, you know, just the initial discomfort to kind of seem like you're doing something exciting, <laughs> a little bit more risky than ordering a Diet Coke or whatever. Does that answer your question, Julie? Yes, it does. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you for calling in. Kyle, tell us a little bit about what your experience has been like working on the front lines of the food and beverage industry. What does alcohol consumption look like when you're working deep in the trenches? Um, heavy, Yeah. honestly. Um, I think it's a it's been a crutch for a very long time in our industry. It's um, something that, you know, as a professional in the industry, you kind of have easier and less expensive access to and mm -hmm. you know um, it's sort of been a bridge in a lot of ways to to in in a lot of the same ways of social settings to build camaraderie and it's just a big ugly beast that kind of unfortunately is preys upon an industry that is full of you know a lot of people who are run dry and just looking for an escape and sometimes unfortunately the easy way is right in front of you. Now is the culture starting to change a little bit? Um, I mean that's hard for me to say because I found myself in a dry space so now, the yeah. owner of Arlington Five uh, was really open to having these dry industry nights uh, because you said that she's been she's chosen to go sober yeah, for a year so, now. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say a year, um, but yeah, she she made a conscious decision, and um, you know, it was just kind of the last. It was the catalyst I needed to just sort of push me to take what I was doing and really put some purpose behind it. So uh, you're doing some really interesting things at Arlington Five. Let's pull up the menu that you sent us just to showcase some of the uh, really exotic ingredients that you're using in cocktails. So uh, we just see that up on the screen there. We're seeing um, banana berry, balsamic, um, espresso, coconut almond rooibos syrup citrus and spice, ginger, lemon, kombucha, buckwheat, honey. I mean, these are ingredients that I wouldn't necessarily uh, think of, you know, when you're going to the bar and ordering something. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what inspires you? How did you come um, up with these recipes? Well, I mean, a lot of that stuff, I mean, a lot of it comes from the fact that I, for a very long time, been experimenting with the idea of coffee in place of spirits. So, you know, taking classic cocktails and removing your your big spirit element and seeing how that could play with something different that's also incredibly complex and incredibly beautiful and really plays a lot further than I think a lot of people believe it does. Um, and that's sort of where it all just started snowballing from. Um, and then a lot of those ingredients are realistically, you know, when you start digging into what's in your spirits, that's what's there. That's like a lot of those ingredients are just me trying to find something that can, you know, bring a feeling of something special, like those dry notes of a juniper berry that really play to a gin without it being this, you know, ethanol soaked spirit, um, but still being a very, complex and thoughtful and um, full experience for anybody who doesn't want that gin experience. And you still feel like you're treating yourself, which I think is really important because so often alcohol is marketed as a way to self-care, which you know may seem hypocritical. And I, want, I want to hear about your perspective, but first we have a caller on the line. Dan, are you with us? I am. Thank you so much for calling in. Did you have a question for our guests? Yeah, uh, I don't drink as much as I used to. I do go up to drink something. Now the hearing, oh, dangerous, some of this stuff. But really, what is this, the alcohol that can make it the least harm? I'm having a hard time hearing you, but uh, did you say what, what kind of alcohol can you drink that causes the least harm? Yes. Okay. Any thoughts on that? What, what do you mean by the least harm? Least like, harm to yeah. your body? or? Yeah. I don't want to have the risk of all the cancer and stuff like that. So if I was to drink something, what can I drink that I could still enjoy without uh, worrying? It sounds like you're maybe asking about 
cleaner types of alcohol. Any thoughts on that? Um, I am not an expert there. Yeah, what about, what do you think, Tim? I'm not an expert either. I would just say that it, it's about moderating the intake of whatever it is. So if you're drinking beer, then the, I, would, uh, I would look at the guidelines for beer versus wine versus hard liquor. Hard liquor is always going to have a, you know, a harder impact for sure. Um, but there's some low alcohol beers mm -hmm. available. I know that my partner has been experimenting with lots of different types of, um, you know, local brews. Uh, yeah, we, we see an image here about yeah. uh, some of the, the guidelines, the percentage of alcohol in beer versus uh, extra strength alcohol mm -hmm. versus spirits and so on. Barbara, I'm just wondering if I go, could go back to, because I feel like there's a lot of callers calling in about this anxiety about not drinking in a drinking yeah, absolutely. setting. absolutely. Let's talk about that. And I just wanted to go back to the beginning when you were asking me what my life looked like in early recovery as opposed to now. And I just want to say that um, I had to relearn how to be social. So it was very nerve-wracking when I first went into those settings, whether it's like a work event or um, somebody's wedding or a cocktail party. Yeah. Um, to the point where I didn't even know how to kind of use my body language. I had to, it was a slow, like, learning process of how to feel comfortable and not anxious in social settings. Um, but I would like to offer some hope to listeners and, and viewers in that um, I have found personally that when I don't drink and I'm in social settings now that I am much more in, engaged in the conversation. I am present. I am listening. Mm. I'm having, I'm more confident with who I am. And those things don't happen overnight, but you do become a lot more comfortable in that environment. And then you realize just how much people are depending on alcohol as a social lubricant. Uh, that's absolutely true, yeah. and I want to toast to that with Kyle's non-alcoholic yeah. beverage here. What yeah. have you brought us? Um, actually, what I brought you here is the catalyst to this whole journey. Um, I guess a little bit of a riff on it, but um, my journey into this sort of mocktail world started with reading a column about a coffee shop in Sweden that was doing a coffee lemonade. Coffee lemonade? Exactly. Um, so, so I just, I always had a curiosity and I always needed to try things. Um, so Thank you. this was one of those things that Thank I was 100% sure was going to be terrible um, <laughs> and then officially changed my life um, in a lot of, like I literally, the second the snow starts to melt, I just like, ne I need lemons because I need to make coffee lemonade. Um, so what's in here? So right now I did a little, uh, it's been a while since I originally did it, so we did a couple upgrades. So we're doing a, it's a yuzu lemon um, with a cinnamon syrup, um, cut with water into a lemonade, and then uh, hit with some cold brew concentrate. Let's take a sip. This is surprisingly good. I oh, never, I yeah. never would have thought of those ingredients going together. It seems counterintuitive. It does, and that's yeah. why I started playing with everything. That's amazing. And what have you brought here? Uh, these are just a mix of tools of my trade. Um, we've got a little aero press, which mm -hmm. most home coffee u users um, mm -hmm. might be aware of, and just my my measuring tools and my stirring tools. Now, do you think people can try some version of this at home? I think try a lot. Making it, I, I mean, mean, I think a lot of things are are pretty simple. This, I mean, you could technically take a store-bought lemonade and some coffee and get somewhere with it mm. um, it's just sort of it's a it's a hit or miss game like, it feels like the yuzu really ties it together now is this on the menu at Arlington 5 now um, not can, at the moment can but people request it people can request um, actually going back to the question that somebody had about sort of feeling left out cool or yeah, left yeah. out um, if you do come by Arlington 5 and it is you know, Monday to Thursday night, and you want to feel like that, and just we, come we, we ask for a dealer's choice. Yeah, we're <laughs> just about to go to break, but I want to hear more about what it is that you do at Arlington 5, and of course, more of your journey, Jen. So when we come back after the break, more of that. Welcome 
Act Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. We're having a conversation about the sober curious movement and how you can abstain from alcohol without feeling like you're missing out. We've got a caller on the line. Emily, are you with us? Do we still have Emily on the line? Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for calling in. Did you have a question? Yeah, so I started drinking um, fairly young. Um, I was in grade nine, so I was about 13. Um, and I don't remember learning in high school about any of the effects of alcohol. And so one night in grade 10, my friend ended up having to go get her stomach pumped. Um, and my mom made me write an essay on binge drinking. And I never had to do any of that in school or learn it. So do you think that the curriculum will ever change and there'll be more of that um, in school as people get more involved in partying? Jen, it sounds like a question for you. I hope so. I think that um, more conversations are happening in all different areas. Um, so I feel like that will you know, ultimately have a trickle effect into the school system. I hope so. I think the most powerful thing is to have you know, young people share their stories um, because it's really hard to tell. I remember my, when my dad gave me a lesson on, you know, um, two beers equals one glass of wine, one glass of wine, and it just sort of went in one ear and went out the other. So I think the most compelling way that you can um, share with with uh, youth the the harm, the harmful, the potential harms of, of drinking is to have uh, more stories being shared. Anything to add to that? Not yeah. really, no. I think I think that really says what needs to be yeah. said. Thank you so much for calling in, Emily. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the ramifications of stepping away from alcohol on friendships um, and your social circles and sort of that feeling of camaraderie and community, which is why I think a lot of people start drinking in the first place. Now, you, Jen, you made the decision to abstain from alcohol before becoming a parent, but it mm -hmm. seems like one of the greatest communities uh, you know, that, that drinks a lot is mm -hmm. you know, the, the mommies, the, mm -hmm. the mommy juice culture. Yeah. Yeah, like certainly I think all parents, it's, it's, a, it's not just moms, it's dads too, but the way that it's, that it's presented, it, the culture of mommy drinking is mommy needs a drink. That's sort of this message that you see everywhere and, and you really don't have to go far to find it. Like I feel like every time I go to a, like a craft sale or... It's um, on a tea towel Yeah, somewhere. or even just yeah. in social media. Um, in in popular television shows and that kind of thing. So um, it really, ha I think it's it's um, um, dangerous because it says that this is how we cope as mothers. This is um, you know if you're having like wine because you've had a hard day, you're exhausted, your kid had a tantrum. We're all doing it, you know, and so when you, when you hear that message when it's all around you, then it becomes difficult to um, a distinguish that you have a problem um, because if you know if you're going for help in sort of a Facebook group, being like I've had a really tough day, and then everybody starts. That's when I really noticed it was when I was in sort of. Um, my mommy group on Facebook where somebody would talk about a difficult day and then it was like line after line after line of like go to the LCBO like there's always wine like have drink a couple, more yeah and then it's like how is this how is this a solution <laughs> yes and I, it shocked me because the peer pressure as a mother to me was even worse than when I was you know yeah. 20 years old at university um, and um, so one it's it can be very difficult to identify you have a problem if everything around you is saying it's normal um, and uh, also like that is not a solution like we need it's a systemic problem like we need more um, support within communities and and um, affordable daycare and these are all the real problems and then yeah. this kind of alcohol uh, thing um, overshadows that and it hides the, the fact that these are you know do we actually have to approach like a really big issues mm -hmm. in society. Mm -hmm. Kyle, who are the people who come in to request these mocktails and these dry beverages? Honestly, a, a, like truly a little bit of everybody. You mm -hmm. know, there's there's the drinkers who don't believe that I can test their palate the same way. There's the people who just honestly are into a 
thoughtful experience. Um, and I think that's where a lot of it comes from because we try and do everything very thoughtfully at Arlington and um, I don't think a lot of our clientele expected in any way that that would suffer by us sort of diving into this night stuff and we do our best to make sure they're very well aware. Of Here's that. an example of some of the cocktails that you've made, some uh, images that you've sent us. I mean, you would you would never know or suspect that anything is missing in terms of in terms of being zero proof. It's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing yeah. is missing. Yeah. They're perfect the way they are. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it's just proof that you know you don't need you don't need it in there to do something big and thoughtful and special and you know. Worth it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now you can get these beverages at Arlington Five from Monday through Thursday. Currently, yes, Monday to Thursday from five to eight. Mm -hmm. um, we run <clears throat> our version of a happy hour before that from three to five. Um, so basically, all your americanos, your long blacks, or your espressos are the same price as the drip coffee. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, I don't think that the the concept of happy hour is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, and why shouldn't we be able to play with the term too? Mm -hmm. And all the beverages that you offer in your cocktails, they all incorporate coffee or tea in some way? For the most part, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I do my best to try and make sure that, that something that we do is involved in mm -hmm. what's going in there. Um, and what have you brought us here? Uh, so we're just going to do a little quick sort of shrub and soda. Okay. Um, so we've got a tropical green tea um, <clears throat> cucumber shrub. Mm -hmm. What is a shrub exactly? They're drinking <laughs> vinegars. Okay. Um, I was curious too. The, yeah. <laughs> the easiest way I can say that, they're drinking vinegars. Um, okay. And then it's cut with a little um, lime and honeydew melon juice. Oh, interesting. And some soda. Now, are you making all these drinks from scratch at Ar Ar Arlington Five? There are not a whole lot of ingredients that I have not done in house, mm. um, aside from obviously our mm -hmm. coffee and teas. Um, we are we just recently brought in like Partake Brewing, which is Ontario's first mm. non-alcoholic craft brewer. Wow! So everything's under 0.5 percent, mm -hmm. um, and honestly really, really fantastic stuff. And now what would you pair this with? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, on my, uh, on my evening menu, probably mm. something like a, like our pimento toast, just okay. to sort of balance out that nice cheesy goodness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's got, it's really fresh and it's a bit citrusy and yeah. um, do you ever experiment with kombucha in your drinks? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got sort of a, Nice big spicy um, hibiscusy mm -hmm. ginger based kombucha drink uh, on my menu. Yeah, I, I, whatever's there, I'm playing with it. Um, and we use a really great like local uh, kombucha called Carlington Booch um, that is a whole other beautiful story all on its own. Are you going to be expanding beyond Arlington Five? Me, I'm a. I, you know, I, I will always be embedded in the walls of Arlington Five, mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll always also be outside of them um, because I don't believe, especially, you know, our coffee and tea community in this city can really start to even thrive until we start to... You bring in those sort of other demographic segments. Honestly, yeah. get along. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, Jen, what, what kinds of drinks, non-alcoholic drinks and beverages do you treat yourself to? Or what are some of the ways you indulge in self-care? As, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, alcohol is often marketed as a way to self-care. Like, mm -hmm. What have you found to replace it? Um, I haven't, I don't really think of it like that so much, um, but... I do love exploring coffee houses. Uh, I um, test out different things that I see on the market in, in Toronto, where I live, that look interesting. There's um, a company that recently did a Kickstarter uh, called Temperance Cocktails, and I don't know if you're familiar with them. I've seen their work. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, um, there's lots of neat things happening, like local makers doing stuff. Um, I went to... Um, a place in Toronto called the Cocktail Emporium on Queen Street, and it is 
for the longest time has been a place where they have just um, al like stuff for, for making alcoholic drinks, and now they have like an entire uh, wall dedicated to this movement, basically. And th it's the only trend that is growing within the drinking space. Mm -hmm. What kinds of resources have been particularly useful to you in your journey? Where have you found the most support? Because the Toronto Star article that you wrote, which is how I found you, right. you mentioned that you felt that AA didn't really um, speak to you that much. It didn't really appeal to you. Uh, well, it did in the beginning. So it was definitely where I um, got sober and I am Always, I will always be grateful for AA and it is often where I point people in the direction to when they are really struggling at the beginning because it is everywhere, it's accessible, um, but as time has gone by I love that we are now acknowledging that there is a lot of different ways that people can get support and those, those things are becoming more um, uh, like mainstream or, or just getting more awareness now. So. There's a community called She Recovers, which is um, started by a mother and daughter in Victoria, BC, and it has grown to become an international movement with 275,000 women in recovery. Wow. And uh, we have a local group in Toronto that we meet every Monday. Um, but they have a whole online area of like, you know, um, Facebook groups and chat rooms where you can get that kind of 24 seven support um, with other women in recovery. Uh, the Temper is a wonderful, n relatively new resource by um, a woman named Holly Whitaker who's just come out with a book called Quit Like a Woman, but it is a great place for um, just showing all different types of mm -hmm. re resources out there. Um, I know in Toronto we also have like harm reduction, um, but there's also just like uh, things that are popping up now. Like um, recently, I saw that there's like a bowling group for you know non-drinkers and and different social events, and I think that's really important too because. Sometimes that's just what people want, you know, Absolutely. a different kind of social environment. Absolutely. And now, Kyle, if, if people want to see what you're up to, would they go to the Cortado and Culture website or? Yeah, or my Instagram or just come and see me at 85. And okay. And you're, you're there I'm four chat. days a week? I'm there most of the time. That Wonderful. My time allows. Thank you so much to you both for Thank coming you. in and sharing your exper expertise and your journeys yeah, with you. our viewers. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great night.